let me get the recording. Right, I'm, I'm looking for, um, okay. So I am gonna, um, the, the portion of this, um, of this panel that I'm gonna be covering is uh, pertaining to somebody's resume, a person's resume. So I actually have a sample resume that I put together to highlight some of the points that we're gonna discuss today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Anita, can I introduce the two panelists? And you oh, yeah, can... yeah, of course. Wait. Let's do that. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm. The second panelist on our panel today is Lori Brady, who's currently working as the global director with over 15 plus years at Oracle. She's responsible for leading a global team and building out the new Advantage U internal recruiting channel for Oracle. She has a passion for developing women's talent, serving as the Oracle's women's leadership community leader for over 10 years, with a solid reputation as a coach, a trusted advisor, and a thoughtful leader in women's development. Welcome to the panel, Laurie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thanks for the opportunity. And third and final panelist for today is Rita Barber, who has over 30 years of experience working closely with founders, boards, executive teams, and managers. She has established herself as a trusted advisor and consultant with companies and individuals alike. She is committed to helping her clients achieve their goals and reach new levels of success by creating successful professional matches. Welcome to the panel, Rita. So glad to have you mm -hmm. too. Thank you for having me. Uh, the audience, feel free to post your questions in the chat. We'll get our panelists to answer it as and when. Like Anita already mentioned, she's going to be covering a few topics about resume writing. So let's get started with our discussion about resume writing. Um, Anita, did you want to go ahead and present your screen first? And we could ask yeah. our questions based on that. Let me... Uh... I'm going to go ahead and just share the uh, document. All right, so we are going to um, we're going to begin with um, with the top of a resume. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different things when it comes to resumes. The first thing I want to talk about is um, well, well, we'll start with the objective. Um, with an objective, you have to be very careful with an objective. I would say either don't put an objective or make your objective general enough that it can speak to any job. Um, for instance, you might say something like um, to work at a company where my skills can be used to further the company's interests. And that's not a, a very good objective, but it's so general that it won't dis detract um, from um, any kind of role or change your objective for every single job submittal. And I say that because I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting with a manager and we're looking at a resume and the objective is not a match for the role that they applied for. And the manager will say, well, the resume looks really interesting, but when I read their objective, um, I don't think they would be interested in my job. I don't even know why they applied to my job given their objective. And so it's, in my, in my humble opinion, um, if you're going to be um, that specific, you need to make sure, like, so um, uh, you need to be diligent about checking that objective every single time or make it just general or just not have an objective at all. Um, I've had more than one manager pass on resumes from an objective alone. And so that, that's the first thing. When it comes to the summary of experience, the summary of experience should really be like a pointer. It should be like a menu, like um, if you're if you're or, or like um, like the table of contents when you're reading a book and you're like, well, what is this book going to be about? And then you read the table of contents and you at a high level, you get an understanding of what the person's skills it, it is um, or are and what I recommend with the summary of experience is that you um, look at a couple of different things. You want your summary of experience to be, um, and you could call it summary of skills, technical skills. You know, there's different titles that you can use for the summary of experience. Um, but you want to make sure that you're covering a couple of different things. Um, the first thing you want to do is that you want to highlight 
the number of years in each of the core areas. Now, if you're trying to do a job change, you're also going to want to include um, a couple of bullet points that point to these skills that you haven't really gained in a um, in the professional world, but maybe you've gained them in other areas. So your um, your summary of skills um, should be precise. Um, you could have one or two. Uh, bullet points uh, that are soft bullet points. Like if you look down here, um, you could also include like uh, career achievements. That's more like a, a, that's like a soft thing. People don't necessarily search unless you're in sales. They don't necessarily search for um, uh, recognition and career achievements, um, things like that. So it's more of a soft skill. Another thing that might be a soft skill is saying, you know, I'm a great team player. I'm detail oriented. Um, those types of things should be the last one or two bullet points. The rest of the bullet points need to be technical or specific to the kind of job that you're looking for and the the um, specifically the correlation of your skills to the kind of job you're looking for. Um, if your summary of skills is all about something that is so unrelated to the job that you're applying for, you're gonna have a very hard time um, for the, the reader to internalize, why, why would I even go beyond the summary of skills? So if you are making that career change, if you're not, that's fantastic. You just have it, have it there like, I have 10 plus years of Java development. Um, maybe you have 10 plus years of SQL or um, you know, elax, el elastic, uh, elastic search or MongoDB, you know, um, uh, database development. Um, but if, if you are trying to make a career transition, you'll want to include some of those hard skills and then some skills that you've gained not in industry that are related to that career transition. So this could, should really be a pointer. And then if you are going to do that, and let's say you've taken on some um, nonprofit uh, opportunities or some side jobs, you'll want to include those um, those side jobs that have given you the experience into that new transition. And so it, it will be a pointer, but somewhere in the resume, there should be that place that you're pointing to with this um, summary of experience. The next section that you want to look at is actually what skills you have. And I like to organize it, um, and those of you who are watching, um, you could just uh, freeze this, take a snapshot of this. I like to organize it in what I would call, um, and I didn't put it here, but it's um, uh, in the technical field, we call it a halo, where you're basically talking about the hardware, the applications, the languages, the operating systems. But you also want to include if you have any, um, if you're in the networking uh, group, like maybe at Oracle, you might be working on the um, the 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 sun uh maybe maybe on a sun server or something you know oracle acquired sun many years ago and so you might have some networking things that are server related here um this should is also a pointer do not put anything in your skills here that you cannot answer technical questions about everything on your resume needs to be something that you can speak to and so one of the recommendations i do recommend um do give to people when they're interviewing and when they're beginning their job search is to memorize and really understand their background and go back and refresh themselves on anything that is on their resume. Because just throwing all of your skills onto the a resume that you've ever done is actually a very bad um, approach. Because then when people go to interview you and you can't answer technical questions, um, what ends up happening is um, they, they just find that you're not qualified for anything. So it's better to be very focused and to, that everything on here you can actually answer at some kind of level and hopefully a deep level. Now with your education, if you have a PhD or a master's, definitely have your education first. Um, if you have a BS degree, if the BS degree is not related to your field of, um, um, your, your field of work, I would probably put the education at the end but if your degree is related to the um, industry that you're working in, you could have it at the beginning. It's it's nice to have your summary of skills and then the, the specific technologies you've worked with and then your degree all um, in one place so that the, the reader 
um, the hiring manager or whoever is looking at the resume, sometimes it's a recruiter, is able to just see right there what your skills are. Um, the last section is the actual experience. And I just want to talk about, um, oh, and, and certifications, if you have them, you can throw those in. And some people put the degree and the certifications at the end. It just depends on how relevant they are to the industry that they're applying to. Um, there are a couple of different formats you could use for a resume. I have a strong preference for the chronological. Um, and I would say the reverse chronological format. Um, this is the one um, I've sat in so many meetings for the last 20 plus years um, with managers and you know, hearing their feedback as they're evaluating resumes has led me to um, conclude that the, the most effective resume is gonna be the reverse chronological and what is that? That is where your most recent job comes first and you um, organize your job, job by job, com um, position by position from most recent to, to least recent. Um, if your experience is completely unrelated and let's say you have more than 10 or 15 years of experience, it is fine to drop some of that experience off. Um, I, a one page resume is not ideal unless you're a new grad or something. A two page resume or a three or a two and a half page, I'd say no more than three pages. You can't, it's very difficult to get the, um, to get all of the detail in somebody's background into one page and you can lose so much of that that a manager may just skip over you so having at least a two or three page resume is ideal um so let's talk about what we're going to put into this experience here you're going to have your name the company name optional is location um the the month and year um through the month and year is good you could do year to year, but that throws a lot of red flags. Like, were you unemployed for six months? You don't want people to have red flags, especially if you had continuous employment throughout. So it's best to just put your, your month and year to month and year, and then your job title. Um, the most effective thing you can do in a resume when it comes to these bullet points is to have, um, have very, uh, um, very powerful bullet points. So what do I mean by powerful? You wanna have active words and I'm just gonna come down here so that you can see my screen, uh, my full screen. Power or action um, words or verbs should start every single sentence. You wanna start your sentence, drop the I. You're gonna start the sentence with, um, the I is implied, created this, architected that, program this, design that, manage this. This shows action. Sometimes people say stuff like, we did this and we did that. You don't want to have it in the we. Um, when you're discussing your background or in your resume, you want to make sure you're talking about just your own personal contributions. Now, in the interview, they may ask what part you did and what part other people did. That's fine. But when you're, when, when you're um, presenting a resume, you're presenting your skills. You're not presenting your entire team's skills. So you want to make sure you limit it, limit it to that. Um, I believe, Raji, have I gone through the 10 minutes? There's more I can discuss, but I want to make sure I leave time for everybody. Yeah, we, we can open up the floor for any quick questions. Sure. While you were mentioning things about we should be doing, Anita, very quickly, what are probably the three top don'ts that we should do in the resume? Like, Make sure you never do those three mistakes in the resume. Well, don't put anything on the resume that you can't discuss. That's pretty key. Um, let's see another don't. Uh, don't. Don't have your sections be large paragraphs that are impossible to go through. You wanna have bullet points that are only one or two sentences long. You don't wanna have a big par paragraph because you're gonna lose the reader. So um, being succinct, making sure you've said everything, but being succinct is very important. Um, let's see, what's another don't? I would say those are actually the two most important things. Thank you for sharing that, Anita. And 
audience, please feel free to post your questions in the chat while we move on to our next panelist and discuss um, and another aspect, and we'll come back to Anita for more and, questions. In. Yeah, and, and, and Raji, I just want to say I can send you this document so you can share it because there's actually a lot of training. Um, I was going through the highlighting the, the things that are probably most imperative, but you can share this with everybody. Um, there's actually a lot more training here that I'm, I'm happy to, to let your, um, your audience uh, use. Thank you so much, Anita. Yeah, I'll, I'll share that with the audience of our session today. So moving on to our other panelists today, we wanted to discuss an aspect of our application process called the cover letter. And uh, Rita has offered us a few insights about why cover letters are required in an application, why do they matter, and how to do a great job at them. So over to you, Rita, to tell us okay. more about Thank you. When you think of a cover letter, a lot of people figure, oh, I've just got to stick this on my resume. And they just quickly put anything together. They put it on there. A cover letter requires thought. And the reason why is because it's really an impact document. It's that first step for you when you're submitting your resume to let whoever is going to read it on the far end see that you are someone they want to know more about right? So when you think about your cover letter, you don't want it to go on way too long. Way too long means that someone will look at it after a couple of seconds and say, yeah, maybe I'll read it later. And then they don't really get back to later because they have so much coming into their inbox at all times. A cover letter basically will let them know why you're writing. I'm sending this to you because of the position you posted in LinkedIn. Your second point is going to be that impact point. That's going to be the point that tells the person who's reading it, hmm, I really want to look at this person's resume. There's something about you that's head and shoulders above what they may have been seeing so far or may see down the road. And when I say head and shoulders above, I don't mean just to say I manage to go a global team. It's important that you put some measurement to what you have to say. You measured, a, you managed a global team of what is the number of people? Will it, will it do something that elevates what the person will see about you? What was the dollar value for what you were doing? Another thing, again, that lets them know, yeah, we need somebody who can do something along that lines. Did you come in on budget? under budget? Did you come in at forecast? All the different little bits and pieces in that strong point that you're going to put into your cover letter. These are all things that do have impact and help you go to that next step. With both cover letters and resumes, they're not going to get you the job, but they'll get your foot in the door. And that's the whole point of it. The cover letter to me is valuable for a lot of reasons. On the rest of the cover letter that we're talking about, that third part is essentially the call to action, so to speak. Uh, please find my resume attached. I'd love to speak with you at your earliest convenience. Here are my details for reaching me. Some people like to get, and based on their personality and what it is that they're interviewing for, a little more aggressive. I'd like to get in touch with you. I'll be out in your area on and they'll share when they're going to be out there. And we'll let them know that they're going to make that first step. I say be careful with that. Do your homework. And that's something that's very important for you to do whenever you're approaching a company. Don't think, oh, I've got to get in there number one fastest. Time is of the essence. That's for sure when it's a job position that's out there. But it is so crucial that you do your homework learn a little bit more about the company, learn a little bit more about the the environment that's there. Think about how does your background work with that environment? It, when you were talking to Anita or Anita was sharing with you about resumes, one of the things that I always think is don't put anything on that resume or in your cover letter that you don't want to do anymore. I don't care how well you do it. Don't put it on there because five will get you 10. They're going to say, hey, 
we want to talk to you about, and it's going to be that thing. Make sure that you're aiming for what it is that you've done and you want to do and where it is that you want to go. So that's the first part of the cover letter. The second part of the cover letter is not really using it as a cover letter, but using it as a marketing document standalone on its own. And that's where I tell people it's always interesting to take a look at what positions you want to go for, wherever they are, even when there isn't something that's advertised. I call it cherry picking, so to speak. It's a little bit like if you are playing baseball or any kind of game, soccer, let's say, you want to hit that ball where nobody is covering it at the moment, all right? It's not necessarily something that you would turn over to HR. You'd probably send this directly to whoever it is that you would be reporting to. But it is something where you would not put a resume there right away, just a high impact here's who I am, here's what I've got, something where someone says, hmm, I could see someone on my team like that, I could use someone like that. Something that will get you into the door, so to speak. That requires even more homework because you need to take a look at who are you sending it to, what has been the movement in that company, all the little bits and pieces that you think this is a lot of work right now, when you're looking for a position, it is work. It's definitely work. But if you think of it, not so much in terms of just doing it with this person, but rather think of doing it as I'm a commodity at this moment. And I need to think about how to market myself as a commodity in the best way possible within the skill sets that I have with everything that it is that I can do. If you do those various steps, you'd be surprised what kind of reactions you receive when you apply for a position, even though one is not advertised. The fact is, is that the US Census Bureau says that it's still over the years consistently one of the very top ways of finding a position. So there's gotta be something to that. Lastly, one thing I'll say is don't do anything goofy. And I share that with you because I was working with someone recently who's a professional so good in so many of the things that he did but he was i said can you send me your material let me take a look at what we're working with here he had this strange duck on his resume and on his cover letter and <laughs> i said so you gotta explain to me what's this duck all about and he said oh well you know it's kind of cool because my middle name da, 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 da. i was not having it right and if I'm not going to have it, i tell you right now, there's not a company that's really going to be warm and fuzzy about it either. Save your cute stuff for home or something. But professionally, I absolutely suggest that you be professional, be buttoned down, do the best job that you can. Don't have those other little bits and pieces there. So Raji, uh, where am I with you on all this time-wise? I have no idea. Yeah, you're almost right on time, Rita. Good. So I can I can maybe quickly ask you a question as our audience is assimilating all this information. So do you recommend the cover letter to be a page or should it be longer? Oh, never more than a page. Never, 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 never more than a page. It's a cover letter. It's not your resume, right? It, so okay. when you think about it, it's just going to cover why you're sending the resume what about you that should make me want to speak to you more? And then a call to action and that's it. Oh, and by the way, always be sure on that cover letter, thinking that it's coming probably from email. It very well could be done at the company, depending on, on how everything is all put together. Always be sure to put your phone number on there because you never know when things get separated and someone may say, oh, this person, I really want to speak to this person, but then you don't have uh, the phone number. You don't have the contact detail. Everything has been separated away. So always make sure contact details on, are on everything to cover yourself. Definitely. A tip to remember, make sure your phone number is on there. And very, very quickly, when you're saying why a person should hire you or look at your resume, how many uh, characteristics or how many technical skills do you recommend we put on a cover letter? Is it two or three or is it just one that you want to highlight? 
it's really a per the position kind of thing. There is no just simple, just do it this way, right? You want to take a look at what the position is asking for, what you've got on your resume, and what you could put on there. And again, though, do make sure that it is high impact from the point of view of I'd rather see one item on there, but you have a lot of measurement to it, right? You're talking about dollar amounts, et cetera, than to have three items on there that are not really telling me, well, what does that mean? You say you're 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 managing a team. Is it a team of people in a small environment, a global environment, nationwide, that sort of thing? Got it. Thank you so much, Rita, for sharing all those tips on writing an effective and impactful cover letter. And we'll get back to you with more questions as our audience post them in the chat. Let's let's move on to our third panelist, who is probably the best person to let us know. How do we get into the phase that we actually lead to an application phase where we get the chance to write a resume or not? Where is that we should go look for jobs and how do we highlight our social media presence such that we land the jobs we like. So maybe to put it simply in, in a short term is how do we increase our social media presence, especially using platforms like Indeed or LinkedIn? And how do we make those social media presence more effective such that recruiters are reaching out to us and asking us to apply for the various jobs that they have to offer? Laurie, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I didn't want the, I have a kitty cat behind me yelling. So I'm <laughs> trying, trying for nobody to know that. So great question. So let me start by, you know, a couple of best practices that I would share or I would coach my candidates. So online, you know, I would customize your resume with some keywords kind of in keywords that the company is looking for that really align to your experience and skills. You know, most companies right now are using AI search tools. So this will at least target and get your resume, you know, in there. The other thing that I would do is I would include in your submission or cover letter, um, like we were talking about earlier, not too long, and also a bio slick sheet, I call it. So you know, it was interesting, Rita was talking about more of a cover letter and then, you know, adding your marketing piece. I, I really agree with that. And, but I have them separately. So it made me think about, okay, I guess you could combine it, you know, great idea. Um, but I call it a slick sheet. And I really look at, I have my candidates include like the last two roles you've had, you know, less than five years. And, you know, start with the most recent role, include your title, a few big accomplishments where, You've either saved the company money, overachieved your sales goals, you know, created some impact for the company. This gives the hiring manager a very quick summary at a glance on what you're all about. Very few candidates will send a package or send more information. And I like to tell me this makes you stand out. So you got to kind of stand out from the masses. So kind of take a step back, think about, all right, what have I done? recently and where have I made my impact? So a couple of places that, you know, I'm not a big fan of online, but, you know, I, I think, you know, networking is better, but I think if you're gonna look for a platform online, I would say LinkedIn, and I would also use, I would say probably LinkedIn is the best, but I would encourage candidates to apply, and then really look at your network to see if there's anyone you know in that company that you could send a quick note to that would submit your resume for you, you know, for those open positions. And I think that is, you know, really key because you've got a lot of volume going on right, then, right now, especially. And so anything that you can to set yourself apart or get yourself in the front of the line uh, to make yourself stand out is fantastic. And then the last kind of piece that I'll talk about really is networking. I'm a huge believer in networking. And the tips that I would say is, I really try to get people to build their network, support, enable, help people before you need to tap that network. 
So if you're out there, you know, you see somebody speaking or you see somebody, uh, maybe they've written a book or, you know, they've done a talk that's, you know, really instrumental, send them a note, you know, offer to help. So if you're kind of teeing up these key things before people need the help, then you've got, um, you know, you've got, you're not just asking cold, hey, can you help me? And, you know, one of the things that I try to do in my own career and, you know, the people that I've coached is every six months, I build a network map. And so I kind of look at it, it's just a circle. I just, you know, draw a circle, it's very simple. And I start, you know, listing out at least five to 10 top people in my network that are tied into my industry that I could pick up the phone and call and say, hey, have you heard about this? Or I'm looking at this job over here, or can you recommend me? Or can you connect me with someone? So that it's always fresh in your mind because there's a lot of changes going on in the industry and you wanna make sure that you know, you're, you're fresh, it's recent and you've been out there connecting. So I would say, you know, those are a couple of my tips um, on what I always, you know, try to try to coach people on. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Laurie. On the note of creating a network and expanding our network, what is, I mean, we have the initial connection based on, like you said, they heard you talk or or any other recent accomplishment that happened. But how do we take that conversation forward to a level that there is a relationship enough to ask for like what's a good call to action at that point should we ask for a meeting should we ask for a call how do we proceed with that kind of things yeah and I think you know it's a great question I think most people are going to help you and so like if somebody reaches out and says hey do you have 15 minutes or can you help me with this you know I'm you know they'll do it but I think the key here is you got to keep it at 15 minutes you can't you know go way over the time so you could reach out and say, gosh, you know, I heard you speak about this. You know, can you tell me a little bit about this or can you connect me? I would say 90% of people will help you. You just got to, you know, do what you say you're going to do. And then, I, and, you know, and then a lot of people, they'll ask for my advice or whatever, and then they never follow up. Like, I never know. Did it help? Did you get the job or, you know, whatever? And so that's another nice thing is to follow up with them and say, you know what? I just want to let you know I landed this new job and, you know, or, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this or whatever, you know, just a quick little follow up. And it doesn't take much. Uh, one of the things that I do on Fridays is I block about an hour on my calendar and I reach out and either send a quick email or I pick up the phone and just stay connected with my network. You know, sometimes I don't have an hour, maybe it's 30 minutes, but it keeps it in front of me. And I'm constantly out there kind of tapping people and checking in, seeing how things are going. That is actually interesting. It's, yeah, you're really right. It's hardly that people follow up and tell that the thing went well. So that's something to keep in mind that follow up and keep that close loop connection uh, yeah. and communication going on. Uh, you also mentioned that it might be advisable to find people in your network who could refer you to particular jobs. And one of our audience member also has the same question is, should it be any member or any employee of the company or should it be somebody actually related to the role that you're applying? Does that change the chances that your application or resume gets reviewed by somebody of uh, somebody who's in the hiring circle? Yeah, do you think? great question. I would say the closer to the job would be more beneficial because they're going to know, you know, they may know the person that they're sending the, the application to. I think as a person submitting that information, it's really important to have the location, the job rec, all the information that they're going to quickly need to pass it over. So if you can get it ready for them and send it over, so much easier for you to you know recommend them or move them on, right? Um, so I would say in your network, if you've got somebody very close, go that route. If you don't, then you know reach out and see if they'll submit it for you. I mean, you know you got a 50/50 shot. Got it. I hope, uh, Kunal, that uh, answers your question about finding somebody closer to job, preferably, or find somebody who can get your foot in the door. Oh, we did have a few questions about how most, especially in online application modules or when we are sending our resumes through emails, they're getting scanned by bots or 
some kind of AI software. So how do we make sure our resumes or cover letters are going beyond these filters? Um, Rita, did you want to answer this question real quick? But how do we make sure we are crossing all these technology filters and reaching out to the right people? Well, I think one thing for sure, don't, again, don't get caught up in yourself in terms of the types of fonts that you use and so forth. Use fonts that are easily read by any kind of software that's going to look at it and pick up keywords. Do something that's called mirroring, where if you're applying for a position and let's say you do one of those functions, but you do that function and call it something else, but you see that the company you're applying to has a different name, do try to use the, the name that that company uses because that's another thing too that a lot of times as your resume is being scanned, it'll look for words that are similar to the position that you're applying for. As If you understand what I mean. Does that make sense? Right, Let absolutely. Yeah, I okay. think com companies' jargons are different. They refer to different positions, different skill sets differently. So it makes sense to kind of edit uh, all all the package that you're sending them out to suit that company's culture and the naming standards. So valuable tip. Thank you for sharing that, Rita. Sure. The next, the next question uh, I'll, I'll maybe ask Anita about, are tables on a resume a good idea? Do they get scanned differently by software or are they more impactful or are they more harmful? I don't recommend using uh, tables on a resume. Um, I actually re recommend it, it kind of similar to what Rita said. You want to use um, simple text that can be re read. If you start um, putting pictures and tables and stuff like that, you run the risk of your resume not being um, um, not being able to be uploaded and scanned properly. And so um, you want to make sure um, and, and also to, to speak to that first question um, about bots, um, you also want to make sure that you are including your re relevant experience. Now, one thing that I didn't cover when I was talking about resumes that you can do is you can have a section where, um, like in the summary of experience, if you have exposure to something, but it's not a core skill, you can still say, um, you know, exposure to uh, node.js and react.js. Maybe you took classes and you could say you took classes and you, but you don't have a professional experience. And that way you won't be, um, you, your resume won't be just deleted because it doesn't have the right bu buzzwords on. Because that's one of the things that the bots do well. It, it's not really bots per se. Like um, we have AI technology that will go in and scan a resume looking for those keywords and surface those resumes to the top so that a manager can see those resumes first. So if you include areas that you have exposure and you're clear that you're not an expert in them, it will allow that resume to still come up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did want to answer the new grad question, um, which is uh, use your projects. Make sure you call it academic projects, but include your projects because until you have real world experience, your academic projects are your experience, what you've done. Um, in college and try to get as many internships as you can. If you're, um, if you're in school right now and you're looking towards, forward towards your new grad role, you want to try to get an internship, at least one, if not two or three. And, um, and then again, use those academic projects to build in that resume. Later, once you have experience, you can, you can condense them and eventually you'll just drop them completely off. But that, that, that will help, um, the hiring manager or the recruiter who's reviewing your resume to see that you have exposure to those areas, they could see what that project is about. I also noticed that there's a question with regards to career transition. And that's an area that I do a lot of work on with people. And I'll tell you, you can have a career transition, but you have to have skills that are transferable. Right. So you may say, oh, I don't have this experience in this particular industry. Well, do you have the same skills that could be used in that particular industry? So it's not just a black and white sort of thing. 
there are an often a, a, many instances where you can look at what skills that it is that you have. A lot of times it's hard to, for you to judge it yourself. We're very self-critical. I think we all know that, right? And we're, we're prepared to mention what we don't have before we'll mention what we do have. So at points like that, it's good to share what you would like to do and which company you would like to do it with, with someone else. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional. It just should be someone who's got some experience in the business world, period, so that they can take a look at it and say, yeah, I could see this as being a good transferable way to go. Or they may tell you, in fact, yeah, I don't think that this really would work in this particular area. Even then, let us say that you can't make that transition from where you are and where you would like to be. Don't worry about that. Don't let that be the thing that stops you. Look for a stepping stone. Look for something else that you can do so that you can transition from where you are to where you want to go with another step or two involved. The pay may be a little bit different for you. So it really depends on how you want to play that and what you need to do. But you can absolutely make that happen if you take the time that you need to really look at it for what it is. And that's why I was saying earlier, by the way, that you're a commodity. Because if you take your own self out of it personally, you'll look at it with clearer eyes oftentimes. Yeah, great point. And if I could- if I can piggyback on what Rita is saying, um, for career transitions, another thing that you can do is you can actually offer your services for free in that area if you can find some smaller company that, that would accept your services so that you can build have like a stepping stone where you're you're keeping your job, your current job, but you're doing something to build that skill set. Um, that tends to be a really great way to build that um that extra experience. Sometimes people will accept um, similar um, experiences that are that there that, that there's some good overlap on, and sometimes they won't. And if you're having difficulty, see if you can find um, a place that you can volunteer. You know, maybe you volunteer ten hours a week for three months or something to 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 um, uh, start building that skill up. Yeah, good point. Uh, and um, and Prachi, if um, uh, you're you're asking a lot of these questions, um, I spoke. Um, I want to say it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, Raji can get you the notes on that as well as the video. There's a way you can also handle um, in the interview um, handle uh, how you present yourself um, for career transitions. So you might go back and use the notes that um, that I sent to to Raji to share as well as the video to kind of train yourself. That is right. Yeah. Anita gave a in-depth presentation about interviewing skills and the various aspects that get covered in interviewing. The link is already on our YouTube channel. So Prachi, go ahead and take a look at it and I can share notes about it as well. Uh, moving on, Laurie, this, this question is directed towards you. Our current job market is I would say a little different than how it is usually in. We have a lot of people with similar skill set trying to look for the same jobs. How do how does one approach it differently than the usual job market when you were just looking for a switch versus in a situation that I need to get the job? How do we approach this situation differently? Yeah, yeah, good question. Well, you're you know right. It, it's a difficult time right now, but it also can be you know uh, a time that we can explore too. And so what I would say is, you know, again, tap your network. Uh, if you don't have the exact skills and you need to find a job, or maybe you've got some of the transferable skills, I would go with some of the temporary companies. Look out at, you know, some of the, you know, so that you can at least get into something while you're looking. And I, I you know, I, I love this kind of consulting work because it gives people, gets them into the loop. They're connecting, they're meeting new people, they're trying things on themselves as they're interviewing and they may even land a full-time job while they're doing that. So 
I would say as you're out there looking, you know, don't get frustrated. And it is, it is, it is a challenge, but it's also a great time for opportunity. I mean, I think in my world, you know, tech's a little bit lower on the hiring side, but there are many, many, many other areas that are hiring. Healthcare, you know, just tons of jobs out there in that space where, you know, your your job may fit into that. And I always have people just very simply get a notebook and really write down the things that they really like and really want to do and really go in that direction, right? And I think Rita said that earlier. Even if you have a lot of experience and you're not loving what you're doing and you don't like it, don't go that direction. Really look for things that give you, you know, energy and passion and go, you know, in that direction. So I would say that, sorry, long-winded, but, you know, lots of different angles out there right now. And you got to try it all because you got to find what's going to work for you. Yeah, very interesting another, point. Uh, another little pointer with regards to competing against other people do some of the things that frankly most people don't do one of my favorite things that i will have people do all the time it doesn't really matter if we're talking about a job situation or if we're talking about a business proposition for a b2b kind of play thank you notes please write thank you notes mm -hmm. write thank you notes to the people who got you from telephone and resume to an in-person interview. Write thank you notes to the person who interviewed you. Write thank you notes to the person who gave you your second interview at that thing. Don't ever not stop writing thank you notes. And by the way, thank you notes are also a valuable marketing tool, frankly. Thank you notes are good anyway, I should just tell you. So, <laughs> but... Thank you notes are very important from the point of view that it gives you a chance to reiterate one point that came up in the interview that you know is a good point to bring up again. And as you mentioned, I am used to, to handling 50 people globally, whatever it is, all right? Because it's a reminder to that person, yeah, he did or she did have that particular thing whatever it was, and they like it. You'd be shocked how many people do not do thank you notes. They just don't do it. And you need to do it if you're not going to just do it. If you're there in person, have some paper and please write a thank you note in your car afterwards. Take it back into the office. Give it to the person and say, could you make sure so-and-so gets that thank you note? I know you might think it's cheesy, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it right then and there, no more than 24 hours, absolutely no more. Time is of the essence. Do a thank you note to whomever it should go to. On those lines, ask them for their email so you can send it directly to them versus having to send it to whoever coordinated the interview. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I would include like the admin, the person that got you in is probably the most valuable person that's going to you know, help you close that, right? Because they'll get you back in and or your recruiter, you know, whoever's helping you, you know, good point. Yeah, it, it's those two simple magic words that will still keep the doors open for you. Have that person added to your network as well. So very valuable tip for all of you adding onto it and advocating it. I hope our audience takes that away and does it the next time they schedule a call with somebody and follow it up with a thank you note for sure. I, I'd like to answer uh, Kishore's question. Um, and, you know, Lori kind of alluded to to this as um, uh, the power of networking, but Kishore asked if uh, applying directly versus um, being referred to a job, if there's any difference. Um, for most companies, if you're referred to a job, especially if the referral, um, the person who's referring you into that job um, has experience working with you and can say something positive about you, um, that is far more um, powerful than just having a, a blind applicant off the streets. Um, at NVIDIA, we hire something um, in the neighborhood of 38% of our um, internal um, hires are referrals. And we place so much value on it that we have a team that goes through every referral and forwards those to the manager. And that doesn't happen with every resume, but it happens with every referral. 
So that that there is a lot of power in references. There's a lot of power in being referred, but um, it's more power if the person actually has working experience. If you're just kind of blindly saying, oh, please refer me to that job. There's not a lot, a lot of power in this. But if you know that person and you have any kind of exposure to them, either on a personal or on a business level, that, you know, it can be one of the most powerful tools um, to get into that new company. And it can also help with those transitions. If you don't, if you don't have the exact background, but they can talk to your tenacity, they can talk to your ability to um, take in new information. They can, they can speak to your, um, your creativeness, things that would um, are soft skills that you can't really see on a resume. And they can assure the person, um, the hiring manager, that you would be able to pick up the other skills. That can make a huge difference, and you you may get considered even if you don't have the the hard skills. So I'll answer this next question. Um, I would say if if hiring managers are going to interview you, they're going to look at your resume. They're going to have that information, you know, in front of them while they're talking to you and looking at you. Um, I, you know, I would say if you are, if you have access to the hiring manager, you may want to send your resume, your interviews in a couple hours, send it two hours before. So it's fresh in their, you know, their email box or have the recruiter, you know, forward it on. But, you know, I would say most good hiring managers are going to have your information up front because they're going to ask those questions and they want to know quickly, you know, your background. Thanks for answering that, Laurie. Um, we are pretty close to the end of the hour and I want um, all our panelists to share one most important thing that you want our audience to take away for them to stand out in the job market. Um, Rita, would you like to go first? I think the one most important thing is attitude is everything, right? So bring in your best attitude from A through Z. If you recently lost your job, take a couple of days to regroup because we never like being caught off guard. You don't want to look for a position when you're feeling that bad feeling when that sort of thing happens. But after that, it's a new day with new opportunities. And you never know. I am a strong believer that when something doesn't go right, it's because something better is on the horizon but I can't find it if I just sit there and I worry about it. So I encourage everybody to decide there is something better in the horizon. It's up to you to find it. Don't just look in one direction too. Don't just look for advertised positions. Decide who are my favorite companies that I would just love to work for and start to plan, start to put together a job plan for yourself and follow up. Thank you so much, Rita. Anita, would you share your one takeaway that our audience today should remember to stand out in the job market? Yeah, I was sitting here thinking, like, is there just one that I could say? <laughs> oh, hey, that it, that's a, a challenging, uh, you know, here, here's, here's what I would say. Um, just one. Oh, my goodness. I'm having a hard time picking just one, uh, Raji. Um, I would say that the the most important thing that you want to do is to to begin branding yourself for the role that you want to go to. You want to brand yourself in your resume. You want to brand yourself on LinkedIn. You want to brand yourself with your friends. You want to um, even even if you don't know who is connected to who, you brand yourself and say, "Hey." I am really good at this. Um, do you know anyone who's looking for this? And um, and use that network and use that um, when and when I say branding, I, I'm like that you're you become the image of what you're trying to 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 go into. Um, and make sure that everyone knows this is who you are and this is what you're good at and um, and get that word out there. So that that would be the best um, the best way. And actually, there's some. There, there's some fun um, tips and tricks that you could do um, that would just help bring your resume up or bring your your profile up. Um, and one of them is just going in and making small edits into your um, online profile so that you're always um, at the top when people are searching. 
um, you know, it, it's not exactly branding, but it's kind of tweaking so that your brand is always coming up in front of the interviewer. Wow. Something we should all definitely try mm -hmm. and brand ourselves such that everybody in our network knows about it. Thank you for sharing that, Anita. Uh, Laurie, what would be your one tip for all of us here to stand out in, in the job market? So again, I don't have one tip, but I would say don't give up right? And be bold and be kind to yourself and follow up, right? And leverage, you know, what Rita and Anita were saying, right? Get out there and connect and network and let everybody know you're open. And this is what, you know, what's your elevator pitch? So just be ready and, and have a plan, right? Thank you so much. A big thank you to our panelists to give out these tips, which are so effective, so impactful and applicable to all of us. I hope all of you had taken down notes and you make sure you try some of these tips out and follow back to us and letting us know if any of the tips helped you. How did you tweak the tip and use it to land the next job that you wanted to? So do let us know and I can share it back to our panelists as well. And you have three more people added to your network to help you out with future opportunities. So glad all of you could join. A big thank you to our panelists again for taking the time out to help all our members out who could be yeah. attending today and would be hearing the recording later on. And thank you for all the attendees for making time and being here. I hope you found some valuable information in here. I'll keep the Zoom room open for a while in case you had any questions um, to follow up with any of our panelists. And I'm going to stop the recording now. And thank you everyone for being here today.